Yeah, so um, I'm always honored to be here. Uh, last year, I, I was standing pretty much in the same spot, and I talked about what we'll finally do when we get around to releasing Gnoradio 3.8. So we got around to releasing Gnoradio 3.8. Um, turns out that's awesome. Also turns out that's definitely not the end of the journey. Um, so what we're going to do in the next minutes um, is going to like take a very, very short look back at what we didn't touch in 3.8. Um, then see uh, what the challenges for the current schedule are in the like very narrow sense, the things that we see right now. And then um, I hope we can project a bit about what has to be solved in the uh, you know, larger scheme of things and how we started to actually tackle that. Because honestly, um, I've been at least at five panels where we discussed what awesome things should be done to the scheduler. And um, yeah, it's time we actually do one of a few of these. So uh, I wish my presenter was working. So um, who am I? I'm going to do this very quickly. I'm still a research assistant at CAL. Um, we got a new logo. Um, I teach a, a couple of the exercise classes. Um, that might be the case because I'm kind of 25% of an institute. Um, and yeah, we're like, on one hand, we're still looking for a PhD candidate. So um, if you're looking for a job, you know, apply. Um, a few of my other roles include, um, you know, supporting uh, Atos and supporting their customers by supporting them with more grumpiness. Um, I'm also a freelance engineer. But as you can imagine, like with a full time job here and a part time job there and um, a happy fun time night time job as chief architect of the radio project that uh, might come a bit short here. Um, so um, what is the state of GNU Radio? I'm obviously not putting up a picture of GNU Radio, which started as a project probably around 99. Uh, we don't know quite for sure. We know when the first code was published. That was a year later. I'm talking about 3.7 um, because that's what a lot of people are still using. So uh, this is pretty much the same slide from last, last year, just that that slide ended here. Um, and since then, we've released 3.8. So that's six year, uh, years of trying to keep an API stable, which means that actually there was a lot of useful development in the user space, the application space. This is awesome. This is something that we definitely want to foster again in the future. We don't want to break things whenever we can. We want to you know, move fast, but don't break things. That's a hard problem, actually. Um, so here I am telling you that way we're going to do a lot of changes. Uh, not all going to be easy, and we'll need to write some code, and we'll break some code. But in the end, everything will be fine. So. Please be on with me while I try to assure you. Um, so because I couldn't stop myself from actually doing that, that's exactly the same slide as last year. Um, um, I've just, you know, um, cleaned it up a bit on, you know, showing that we've done all this. Um, like from 3.7.0 to 3.8.0, that's only like 380, you know, changed lines of code. Um, that is okay-ish, considering that includes code reformatting, includes all the white space. That is actually a lot of work. And it's pretty amazing that basically um, all out of three modules will be compatible with Unreal you know, 3.8. I can't think of many that have like architecturally problems with becoming 3.8 compatible. It's mostly mechanical code changes and the fact that your Python needs to be Python 3 if you want to be you know, future proof and not only work with 3.8 because, as uh, mentioned before by Andre, uh, we are dropping Python 2 for anything after 3.8, which kind of is the right thing because Python just dropped Python 2. Um, so, but what didn't we change? We didn't change anything about how um, we modularize our code. So that's still like you know, right, the runtime. We've got all the gr minus what ifs modules in there, and we're actually putting in more. Um, as as uh, for three nine, so um, we also didn't change really like what the project is about. It's about CPU bound 
or CPU-based processing of software-defined radio signals. Um, if it works for audio, if it works for sonar, if it works for your favorite, you know, whatever 1D signal, fine. But, you know, the scope of the project really is software-defined radio at this point. Um, and another thing is that we really didn't change the way we think about contributions. So um, if you got a patch, you send it upstream. We do this by, with GitHub by now. We didn't do that with GitHub when we started 3.7. But it's really like, you know, very mostly bug fix oriented code contributions. And we're just now getting up to speed with how to encourage people to submit code upstream. And for, for example, just code would be highly be a candidate for you know upstreaming, considering that it has a broader usage and a lot of people aren't really happy with the equalizer that are in tree. Like if you, I, I've just had a talk at Ether, right? About people trying to uh, sync on UART packages won't work with the current equalizers because they're simply too slow. Like, your package is gone the moment your equalizer locks. Um, and the main thing is we didn't change the scheduler. So now I'm, I'm doing this funky finger thing, um, the air quotation marks. Why am I doing the air quotation marks? Um, I think, like, everyone loves the GNU radio scheduler, right? I throw in my block. It gets executed. I don't have to worry about anything. All I have to worry about as a developer of a signal processing transformative step is take my code, put it into a work function which has an input buffer, has output buffers, and I just write stuff into the output buffer and tell the runtime how much that was, right? Um, so um, to understand why that's not the perfect way to do it, we'll need to, sh you know, um, go a bit into the history and do maybe a very, very, very short uh, introduction to how GNU radio scheduling works. I tried to actually put everything in, in that uh, presentation. <laughs> then I realized I, you know, held such a presentation last year, took one of them half hours. Couldn't do that here. So uh, we're doing this, uh, this a bit easier. Like originally, um, GNU radio from the start was a single core oriented um, uh, framework. Why? Because 1999 there was no easily available multi-core CPU machines that you'd usually have access to as a private person. And that was what, you know, the developers were um, ideologically aiming for. So what it was, it was take an abstract representation of a flow graph, of a signal processing graph, flatten that graph. So that's a directive r cycle graph. There was no message async stuff in there. There was just uh, samples going around. Um, then analyze that graph, find the sources in that graph. That's rather simple. You start at any node. You do a backward search until you re uh, reach a root node. And then you check whether you've you know, colored all your tree, uh, all your uh, graph nodes. And if that's the case, you're done. So you find all the sources. You call their work functions. They produce samples in their output buffers. And then you basically take these samples, call the down, like take one of the sources outputs, call the downstream block, let that ripple through the graph, and you repeat that until you're basically blocked by someone missing new input. And then you go back one step, backtrace, and run another iteration on that block. So I hope that if I, I say something wrong, like the editors of the project, which aren't, no, Tom's not here. <sighs> um, so I'm not saying anything wrong. Um, so we later renamed that. I was around 2009. We later renamed that to the single thread scheduler because we went in and you said, we said, oh, now that dual core, even quad core machines are readily available, cheaply available even, um, becoming the norm, um, we want to like, you know, have multiple threads. And what we did was, um, let's say we algorithmically simplified, dummified even. Um, we just took every block, put them in their own thread, still discovered the sources, called the sources, they produced some data, and then we just had like this message passing thing where we notified all the neighbors of these blocks that, hey, something has changed. And the individual block executors and their threads would then go in and analyze what that mean meant. And that usually man means that you start processing the samples, which is fine. You know, I can write it down in like literally four lines of C, like the algorithm, pseudo C. Um, and that's fine. Problem is, um, like, 
the average flow graph has more blocks than I have CPU cores in my machine. And unless I'm not working for Amazon or Google, that's probably going to stay that way. So um, uh, with that in mind, we can see that, OK, this is a very flexible, extremely easy uh, way of doing it. And it leverages the fact that operating systems are getting pretty, pretty good at scheduling tasks when they're ready, when they know that um, they have data available when they're not blocked on something. And uh, we can really see that the, the um, Linux scheduler, at very least, does a decent job at you know finding heuristics of when to schedule what. Um, but it's not, you know, it has simply no clue. Oops. Uh, the Linux scheduler has no clue about what the data flow is, right? There's only threads, and some thread says, oh, it has a mute, holds a mutex, and we notify that mutex. So some condition variable changed, some f mutex is calling. Suddenly, you're, you're in the wild. You don't know who of these 15 threads to schedule next. Um, so this is fine. It works. It's surprisingly performant. But it's also a bit depressing, right? Because that means that we had this, you know, someone thought about how to build that single thread scheduler. And then someone else, like this, the same group of people, thought about how to build a multi-threaded scheduler. And they started with the simplest thing that comes to mind. And it actually, like, you know, bet the hell out of that. Because if you have four cores, that's three cores more than you used to have. And, you know, you can have a lot of inefficiency there. Um, um, so let us, you know, take a step back and actually look at what um, makes GNU Radio your signal um, flow actually tick. Um, and I, I like to call it a back pressure driven um, and with the thread per block scheduler parallel signal processing architecture, meaning that while, for example, the file sync might still be processing the samples, writing them to a file, um, the multiply const uh, block here in the middle might already be working on the next chunk of things because that's the way it is. Like the signal source just notified multiply cons, multiply cons did some calculations, wrote to the output buffer and notified the file sync. And in the meantime, the signal source might have already been notified by multiply cons that, hey, you've got some, like I'm done, you can do some more work for me, could you please? So these two can run in parallel. And in the end, like in a stable situation, all three basically could run in parallel. But as said, like no flow graph is as simple as that. Most have way more uh, blocks than CPU cores. Um, so the, the, you know, the perceived parallelism isn't actually there. It's just maxing out your CPU usage, best case. Um, so, nope. Ah, so um, that's why I put the scheduler in quotation marks, right? There is no scheduling of things. We just tell everyone at every point in time that, hey, I'm done. Or, hey, you've got so, like, I'm done, you've got some more output to produce. And as you can imagine, like, this has a bit of overhead in terms of messaging. And it also doesn't really qualify as, you know, informing anyone of the intent of your data flow. Why is that important on norm normal machines? Well, if you've got, like, think of an old style CPU, you only have RAM and registers and that's it, right? So whenever you exchange a big portion of data, you always write that to RAM and get it out in the next block. So problem is that's not how modern CPUs work. Modern CPUs have caches and these caches are inherently local. So it would be very desirable that, for example, if I had a lot of blocks and this is just a part of my flow graph, that three, these three blocks would run on the same CPU core. Why? Because then the output of that block would never leave the cache of that CPU core. The multiply cons would then be called on data and cache and write to a cache data for the file sync. Another thing is, it's obviously beneficial if we just try to execute these in sequence all over again. Why? Because then with lower cache usage, I can keep the same locality. So um, we have no way of actually integrating that knowledge into the current scheduler. Um, bad thing, but um, here's we're gonna, how we're going to solve it. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'm kind of speeding up here. Uh, so um, 
what we did in the past is we let the uh, single thread scheduler die. Not because it was a bad scheduler, but because we concentrated on a different one and then we added features that only the newer scheduler supports. So if you're using message passing in the asynchronous case, that's not a feature supported by the single thread scheduler, which is sad. It's not technically impossible to do that. It's just, you know, we never thought about the, how to do that and how to come up with an architecture. So we let things die. Um, and we also didn't come up with a way of measuring how well our scheduler works while we were still developing it. You know, it was all an afterthought. We, we added control port to figure out when, how many uh, milliseconds your block call took on average. We measured, uh, we added metrics after the fact. Now the problem is, if we're going to do better than that, we should be starting with metrics up front, right? Because other than that, we might probably make things worse first. Um, so uh, this is uh, a bit of a trouble here because measuring runtime and dynamically allocating um, signal flow is a hard problem. You can't just go and say, everyone halt. I want to know how much time you spend and you spend and you spend and you spend because that might all have happened like in this instance. You're just changing where data is flowing, like DMA transfers will happen in the back, uh, behind your back while you're holding everything and observing everything. So the, all you can do is either do statistics or hope for the best. Um, and we are, we're going to change that and we see how that's possible. So what we hope to do is um, write a scheduler that's, you know, something we actually understand. So we have this thread per block scheduler, and it's like fairly simple in principle, like I've just explained. I hope that the principle was kind of clear. Um, but it has like a lot of these states. Is that block done? Is it block on input? Is it block on output? Is it, you know, currently processing something? Um, what, what are we going to do when we say, okay, this flow graph is done now. How do we flush out the remaining data in the, in the, in the data flow graph? Um, we need something, and that's pretty dear to a lot of people in this room, that's actually extensible. We don't want things to be the single scheduler that you want to use in the radio. You need a scheduler for, for workloads that look like a path. I really like where I look at it and say, okay, the optimal solution to this is obviously, you know, doing it in, in circles as fast as possible, and situations where we have things that look more like a network of graphs where packets might be sent around, even ha taking different routes through my signal processing flow graph, depending on what that packet contains, right? So if I'm decoding Wi-Fi, not all packets are data packets. Some packets might just be needed for equalization purposes or, you know, initialization purposes. They need, need to go down different routes. So that's something that the current scheduler architecture can't really do. Um, so we started to think about how to actually write a new scheduler. And the problem with that is um, how, how do you start doing that if you've got a block that does so much? Everyone who's like, who's, who's already written a radio block in this room? Can I see hands? So that's a little more than half of you. So you really know that you know, a radio block has this work function that takes an input and an output buffer or multiples of these, but also you can have something like a forecast, which you need if, you're, if you have, don't have a fixed rate from input to output. It also can have like things to check whether the in number of inputs works with the number of outputs you offered. It also has a lot of things that you don't really need to have, like this purity of essence kind of, I want to process samples. That's a transformation between input to output. Um, a lot of things that encapsulate the state of your signal processing, but not from a signal processing point of view, but from the you know, data marshalling scheduling point of view. So that is a really hard problem that we see there. Why? Um, you know, if I want to take that block and schedule it elsewhere, be it like a different scheduler type, because I realize like this scheduler is not working out for that subgraph, or whether I want to say, okay, that block goes to AWS now, it doesn't run on my uh, computer anymore, receives low rate data and you know, needs processing power that I can't offer locally. I can't do that with that. It's not possible to you know, actually transparently plug out um, a block and move it elsewhere because the block is so f intensely 
interfacing with the scheduler on a basic basis that actually fills with the internals of the scheduler that we know were documented as an API. It's emergent behavior that everyone got used to. Like we're fixing a lot of bugs because, oh, that's how people are using the scheduler. Interesting. That should be working. We did something, it broke that, and now we have to figure out a way to actually um, make it work again because you know we try to not break user land. So um, we needed a cut. We needed to say, okay, what's a block? What is good about a GNU Radio block? And what's not necessary about a GNU Radio block? And um, so we implemented a new block.h. That's what we were doing at the Hackfests at ESA. Um, and that was really like, that is a block that's tremendously reduced compared to the original Gun Radio block. It really only has a work function. And instead of, you know, having uh, input items and output items pointers, and then also a parameter that tells you how much output uh, items you can maximally produce, but ignoring the fact that you have multiple outputs so that these might be multiple numbers, and expecting you to actually, you know, tell the scheduler how much you consumed, we kind of try to put that into objects that the scheduler calls you with so that we are getting more like a functional interface. Why? Because basically computer science tells us that lambdas are better to reason about than things that change the state of the world around them, right? So um, especially if you're writing an FPGA uh, implementation of something, you don't want to that FPGA implementation to have to go back and tell the CPU bound scheduler that, hey, I'm now producing 20 items. That's nothing it ha should be caring about, first of all. And second of all, you literally can't without incurring like an overhead that's probably way worse than doing the home computation on the CPU itself. So um, that's why we're trying to you know, move away from the classical work thing. Um, another thing is, right now people are writing two different kinds of blocks. They're writing like the classical stream operation blocks, like your FM demodulator, or your mod demodulator for a stream of OFDM frames, like say in DVBT. And they're writing really packet data things, like what comes out of your stream demodulator, what is a Wi-Fi packet. And they put these into asynchronous messages because they don't really fit the, I have a contiguous memory buffer where I could write in samples paradigm, and it also really doesn't fit that you don't want to allocate these. Um, so that hopefully allows us to have a single unified interface for both instead of having two different paradigms in the same uh, idea of how we, we do work. So that's the block-centric view. This is what I would call the OOT module implementers view of things. And then I've got um, new, oops, um, the scheduling interface. So the scheduling interface obviously now gets a graph that's made of, out of these connected blocks, right? And it's still, I know, uh, it's still a graph. Um, but instead of just, you know, distributing messages to all blocks that run in, e uh, in a thread each, we introduce workers. Like, I mean, web servers have been doing that since around 1995. Um, uh, we just have one worker per CPU core, and that worker is the owner of a couple of blocks that it executes. So instead of sending messages to a block executor, we work, send messages about, hey, I've just updated my output to a worker. That worker will then aggreg uh, aggregate all the messages that it got while the main work that it was currently executing was executing after that work is done, reorder if necessary, and execute that. So kind of imagine that as a queue with knowledge of what's done inside, right? So this is for a CPU scheduler should pretty easily work because that's basically, I mean, if you're implementing a simple OS, that's exactly how you implement scheduling threads. You have a queue of threads that should be doing stuff, and then you check whether any of these had any update. So um, that's easy. Um, but also, that gives us a very clear interface of how to communicate with other scheduling domains. So I'm introducing the concept of a scheduling domain that's like 
hey, I've got a CPU bound scheduler. Hey, I've got a scheduler that actually runs on a GPU. Or hey, I've got a scheduler that actually runs on an FPGA in, on a data center somewhere else. Um, and all that it has to do is receive messages. And the good thing about receiving messages is you're not really bound to having them in a shared memory space, right? You can do that over network. Meaning that this is going to be transparent. We can simply zero MQ that to you know, your neighbor's PC uh, and have that work. So that's um, what we're doing in, in terms of scheduling architecture. So uh, could you press the next button? Yeah, it works. Um, uh, so what, what are we expecting from this? So um, I said like we'll be able to transparently move blocks. We'll be able to exchange schedulers, and that's a big deal for us. So that's actually where currently our main research is. Like we can do awesome things in block. We can write the coolest equalizers, but at the end of the day, we're limited by the computational resources that we can utilize. Yeah? In a lot of places, we could basically have infinite money, but we don't have infinite bandwidth. So uh, yeah. We need to solve that. Um, and also, we've been stuck for 20 years with basically the same scheduling paradigm. And it might just be the case that we need to just experiment, get our fingers you know, a bit muddy on how to you know, work things. Um, so I've got three minutes for questions. And if anyone wants to leave, if we could do that quickly, so that I can shuffle. So I don't know the order of things, so but I let the gentleman in uh, front. Yeah, so you we'll obviously produce these metrics. Do you mind if I pause you some? Yeah, sure. Go away. So the metrics. The metrics. Mm. Would you be exposing those back to so that you can face so people could actually look at what they're producing and then oh, so maybe tune in themselves. So the, the, like the question was, how, what, what, what would the metrics interface look like? What could people do with that? Yeah. And um, that's pretty easy. Like basically, most of the metrics are simply emergent properties of the messages that we're exchanging, right? So I could just say, OK, splice that message to a observer and do that. The hopes are that people who are into scheduling are optimizing based on what they can observe there. Um, Another hope is that we can just throw, you know, PhD students at that problem until it actually works. And if that doesn't work, we still have machine learning. Um, uh, so that's that's the one thing. Um, yeah. The other thing is that we already have, like I, I mentioned, contraport. We have ways of measuring performance. They are just not utilized very well because they're, you know, API-wise very awkward. I'm just going to go ahead with you. So the question is whether like real-time Linux capabilities are beneficial. So Basti Blosser wrote a paper on uh, the influence of scheduling um, uh, strategies of the OS kernel for radio, and you can actually increase performance if you're doing a bit more, you know, preempting, guaranteeing latencies. But there's only so much you can do. So, um, like, basically, real-time Linux always does a trade-off between latency and rate, and we're not willing to go that way. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm out of time. Um, I'll have to hand over, like, I gladly hand over my microphone to the next speaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.